All right, so uh, our next speaker is Yanu from Riverside, and she's going to tell us about cosmic archaeology with gravitational waves from Axiom Cosmic Strings. Please go ahead. Uh Okay, uh, so I want to first thank the organizers for organizing this uh, great workshop and inviting me to uh, speak. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, give this talk. I will tell you about the cosmic archaeology with gravity waves from cosmic strings, along with the uh, interesting application to axion physics. Uh, this is based on a series of work that I've done uh, since uh, shortly after the LIGO discovery. So gravitational wave from uh, cosmic strings, we have heard a lot about this uh, in earlier talks. So just recap, cosmic strings are well-motivated topological defects that can arise from uh, U1 symmetry breaking or super string theory, and it can be a strong source for gravity waves. Um, the basic aspect, in the interest of time, uh, I'll refer uh, the basic aspects about strings to the earlier talks like by David and Kai and well, also hear more about this topic later. You also see that the uh, discussion uh, in my talk also resonated with the, the spirit in Anson's talk yesterday, although we're considering different source. So let me just go straight to the specific topics I want to tell you about today. So I will tell you about this, uh, several aspects, uh, several ways that we can use gravity waves from cosmic strings to probe the early universe cosmology and the new particle physics. So the first part of this talk uh, is mostly in the context of number go to or gauge strings, uh, which is most studied in the literature. Then I also tell you about gravity waves from global axon strings uh, and uh, its application in probing uh, axon models. Then I'll come to conclusions. Okay, now, now let's start with the first part. So to lay the motivation, I just want to remind you about this uh, important unknown aspect of uh, cosmology that is a pre-BBN era. So although in the past decades, our understanding about our universe has gone a long way, but the earliest time that we have observational uh, data to, uh, to probe is the BBN era. And then the best precision tool we have so far, uh, the CMB light was emitted uh, much later. What happened before the BBN? We do have a standard cosmology theory, but there are many assumptions there to be tested, yet to be tested, and there are many unknowns. So what happened within the first second, this pre-BBN era is also, uh, is a big gap in our understanding. This uh, era is also called the primordial dark age. We can uh, see this gap amplified if we uh, draw the cosmic history, uh, the expansion history on the log scale temperature or the expansion parameter A. So in our paradigm, the universe is radiation dominated with a standard model particle content from the matter radiation equality all the way back to the end of inflation. So this is actually, if you think about it, up to uh, over 20 order magnitudes of uh, assumption or extrapolation on the temperature or the expansion parameter scale. Is this really true? So now let's come back to this uh, discussion here. Hopefully it's clear that it would be very desirable if we could uh, directly probe this pre-BBN era, the primordial dark age, which includes inflation, uh, which people talk about most, and also the post-inflationary thermal history, which has been shown to have potential impact on the dark matter detection today. So for a long time, this has been a very challenging thing to do, but now the good news is that we discovered gravity waves. And thanks to the fact that gravity waves is very weakly interacting, uh, it can, uh, potentially penetrate this BBM barrier and bring information to us from the end of the inflation. Okay, oh, so then uh, in, in uh, practice, how can we utilize gravity waves as uh, for this purpose? So I have seen um, some ideas uh, in this workshop. So what I will tell you about is that the uh, cosmic gravitational waves from cosmic strings uh, could provide uh, um, uh, great tool to uh, address that question. So let me remind you that gravity waves can be emitted from oscillating string loops. Then over the time, this continuous emission over the history accumulate and would form a relic stochastic background. This, uh, the backgrounds from strings, uh, because of the, due to the continuous emission is spanned over a wide range in the frequency. 
So this is uh, in contrast to many other sources like first order phase transition, which you see as a sort of a peaky signal. And this continuous uh, emission and uh, span over wide frequency range is important uh, uh, underlying principle uh, to do the archaeology that I, would, that I will tell you about. Okay, so uh, to be self-complete, I just want to uh, flash through some of the essentials to uh, of this uh, the calculation uh, the essentials of calculating gravity wave background from the strings, uh, but you don't need to worry about not following the details. I will tell you where to take note on. Okay, so we need to first assume a, a loop size distribution at the formation time justified by recent simulation result. Then we work out the loop formation rate. Now, after a string loop is created, it would radiate gravitational wave. Uh, and then uh, with, with this uh, uh, formula here, then as it radiates away energy, the loop size will shrink over the time. Now today, the observed frequency would be determined by the loop size at the emission time uh, multiplied by the redshift factor. So now putting things together with some over different uh, oscillation modes, this is where I want you to take a uh, note on. So the formulas here still look a bit complex, but the only thing that you need to uh, really uh, remember is that the expansion parameter A as a function of time is a key determining factor uh, in the expression, uh, in the prediction for the gravity wave signal, as you can see here. Or to say that the cosmic, equivalently, the cosmic expansion history, the Hubble rate, is encoded in the prediction for the omega GW. Now, if you turn around, then we can also expect that by observing a certain pattern of the omega GW uh, frequency spectrum, we'll be able to infer the evolution of the, uh, this, uh, the A parameter or the Hubble expansion rate. So now uh, the first, so basically we will plug in different cosmic history uh, to this expression and see what spectrum we can get. So the first obvious exercise to do is to plug in the center cosmology. Uh, with some benchmark parameter choice. So here, this is solid black line is a prediction uh, with the center cosmology. The key feature, as you can observe and you heard from other talks, is that there's a long, uh, nearly flat plateau towards a high frequency corresponding to the emission during the radiation dominated era. Another thing that I will elaborate in the next slide is that gravity waves with a given frequency band within the group Given frequency band here was mainly contributed by loops formed at a certain time or temperature. And the higher frequency corresponds to earlier time. So essentially, if you look towards a higher frequency uh, of the spectrum here, you are looking back in time to extract information about the early universe. Um, and this essentially is the, the idea that we propose for cosmic archaeology. So in our work, we quantify this frequency temperature dependence in detail. As you can see, there are some parameters, but it's not that complicated. The frequency and the temperature, radiation temperature, is linear, has a linear relation. Now we put to test this theoretical principle um, uh, to see how well it can uh, actually work in uh, practice by considering the experimental sensitivities. And we found that with this method and the upcoming gravity wave experiment, we can potentially be sensitive to uh, probe the, uh, the history of the universe uh, from the BBN all the way up to uh, almost uh, about uh, uh, 10 TV in temperature. Okay, so what we have seen in the last, uh, uh, the earlier slide is a spectrum uh, if we plug in the center cosmology. But not recently, uh, there have been uh, uh, interest, a rising interest in considering the possibility of non-center cosmology, meaning that there may be new equation of the state of the universe uh, that deviate from what we expect from the center, uh, the center history. And they are well motivated. For instance, there could be early matter domination, it could be kinetium, and they connect to important topics like ferrogenesis, dark energy axion physics. Essentially, in this scenario, we're taking a break from the uh, boring, uh, very prolonged ep epoch of radiation dominant era. So 
in this scenario, um, the energy density of the universe would scale differently uh, from the uh, radiation dominant era, the minus four uh, power law. Instead, you have minus three, minus six, or other possibilities. Now, if you recall one of the slides early on, I, I emphasized uh, for you to uh, take note on the omega GW uh, prediction is very sensitive to the Hubble expansion rate uh, evolution. And now by freedom equation, if we change the equation of state, we would also change the Hubble evolution in terms of uh, uh, A and also the Hubble evolution in terms of time. So now what we do is we plug in this, uh, uh, some benchmark examples of the uh, non center cosmic history and see how the spectrum change. Again, to remind you, this solid black line is the prediction from center model, uh, the center cosmology. Now we assume that at uh, two benchmark temperatures, uh, well before BBN, so that's safe, uh, the radiation dominant era transit to a kination or early matter domination. Then for kination, these are uh, what the rising line here predict. Well, for early matter domination, you see uh, the spectral start to fall uh, at, towards a higher frequency. Then this transition point on the frequency spectrum is exactly what we can predict based on the FT correspondence that I showed you earlier. Okay, So again, this is a cool thing about looking back in time uh, by looking at the uh, gravity wave spectrum. So there are other cool things that we can probe with the gravity wave uh, spectrum from the strings. Uh, here, I'll sh also show you how we can probe a new degrees of freedom. So as we know, uh, the BSM theories almost universally uh, predict new particles uh, beyond the center model, new degrees of freedom. There could be hundreds of them, like a dark sector or solving a hierarchy problem. These degrees of freedom, they could be very massive, so they can not be uh, tracked down by CMB or the LHC, but they could still be in form of radiation in the early universe, contribute to this uh, uh, relativistic number of relativistic degrees of freedom, G star. So if you uh, recall that, uh, again, the gravity wave signal is very sensitive to the Hubble. And the Hubble in the radiation dominated universe uh, is very sensitive to this G star, uh, the, this prefactor. So the exercise we do here is that we consider uh, that around the 100 GV scale, there's a, uh, a number of new degrees of freedom kicked in which may help solve the hierarchy problem, like a neutral naturalist model. Then we uh, compute the gravity wave uh, signal and found that uh, due to the, this increase in the uh, G star, this gravity wave spectrum at the higher frequency, this uh, would be the flat, uh, the plateau area would uh, decrease. And the more degrees of freedom you add in there, uh, the, the more dramatic the decrease is. So this is another way that uh, we can uh, uh, detect a uh, new uh, cosmology. But in that way, it's more about new particle physics. So there's a, yet another way of doing cosmic archaeology that I'm going to show you here. This is a, a maybe counterintuitive. Essentially, I'm going to tell you that even if the cosmic strings were diluted by inflation, if the string network formed before inflation or shortly after inflation, they can actually leave detectable signal today. So you probably uh, all realize that this seems to be in contradiction with our standard law that inflation should bury all the relics before it. Now, how could this work? So how is this possible? Uh, I only have time to briefly explain here, but uh, the essential thing here is that um, the correlation length or the roughly speaking, the long string length uh, the scale it's a key parameter for the string network evolution and also to determine its uh, uh, this network energy density. Then during the inflation, this correlation length exponentially grows and the strings are uh, busted out of horizon from each other. So that's the dilution era. But after the inflation, this correlation length conformally scale with A. Now, if you compare uh, this growth rate uh, with the growth rate of horizon size after inflation, either matter or radiation domination, you find that this correlation length actually grows slower than uh, the horizon size. So this suggests there's a possibility that 
the stream can grow back into horizon after inflation. After a certain uh, critical time or this redshift that we can work out uh, by solving the, uh, the string network evolution. So consequently, in this scenario, we found that uh, the gravity wave signal could still be detectable today, uh, although it uh, uh, reveals itself in a distinct pattern different from the standard scenario that uh, we're familiar with. So first, in terms of stochastic background, uh, as shown here, uh, this, the top two lines are without dilution in the standard scenario. And then these uh, uh, with the dilution has other parameters the same. So you can see that the stochastic background signal is suppressed, in particular at higher frequency. And uh, consequently, the, uh, the strong constraints on the GMO that we often talk about, for instance, from positive timing or LIGO, can actually be alleviated in this scenario because of this suppression uh, due to the earlier dilution. On the other note, another signal channel called the gravity wave burst actually could be important here. So gravity wave burst is, has the same physics uh, origin as the stochastic background. Uh, only that these are from the events that ha happen later uh, nearby us. So they would reveal themselves as a transient resolvable signal uh, instead of stochastic background in the observation. So usually this channel is subleading to the uh, uh, stochastic background in terms of sensitivities to say GMU. But in this scenario, the diluted case, they can be the leading discovery channel. And here we will also work out the event rate for this burst event uh, and found that even with dilution, they could have a detectable rate. Okay, so now uh, the last part of the talk, I will switch gear to talk about strings from global U1 breaking, which closely relate to axon physics. So this is based on uh, uh, some of the uh, work and an ongoing work with my student, Chai Feng Chang, who is very good, where we consider uh, gravity waves from axion topological defects as new probes for axion-like uh, models. Most of us uh, here are uh, familiar with uh, the fact that axion-like particles are leading alternative to wind paradigm as dark matter candidate, and has drawn a lot of uh, uh, interest and work effort recently. But the relatively underdeveloped aspect of ALP study is the implication of ELP topological defects. These are the ELP axon domain walls, uh, cosmic strings domain walls, which are indispensable companion of the ELP particles if the PQ symmetry happens after inflation. And it can potentially uh, have an important uh, uh, effect on the axon dark matter physics and how we detect them. Although this is uh, only captured attention recently, uh, it has seen a rapid increase in the interest uh, in uh, multiple uh, fronts. So the question that we ask is, uh, could there be uh, detectable gravity wave signals from axon cosmic strings? So this topic is overlooked, uh, but potentially a discovery channel. Why it is overlooked? Uh, because by naive estimate, uh, the signal is too small as I'll explain shortly. And some of the earlier literature before our work, uh, there are very few of them. Some of them even suggest that uh, uh, the signal is not detectable at all. So let me uh, review two key differences between the gauge or local strings versus the uh, number go to string versus axon or global strings. So the first is that the, the gravity wave radiation in this case is subleading to the gold zone emission, uh, which is a, a much a, a stronger mode in this case. So you can compare this, uh, you can see this by simply compare the radiation power of the, these two modes. So the gravity wave signal would be suppressed relatively for, for sure. Another key difference is that the axons or a global string, the string tension has a log divergence factor that is time dependent and it's cut off by the correlation length and the string core width. So this log parameter we can call it N, uh, this could be used as a time parameter that um, uh, used by this, many of these uh, inflation studies, uh, sorry, not inflation, simulation studies uh, that I will refer to uh, later. So although the gravity wave radiation is expected to be a, a subleading mode relative to the ghost zone, uh, it could still be important because uh, we have learned, uh, for instance, from Higgs discovery that a rare decay mode could be the discovery mode for various reasons. 
And also, although you can say uh, if there are a lot more go zone axion produced, why don't I look for those? The thing is, those uh, the detection of the, the go zone mode is very model dependent. Uh, we don't really know how it interacts with standard model. Um, so there's uncertainty there, uh, although it's worthwhile to do. But gravity wave signal is a universal, uh, uh, has a universal nature. We know how it behaves. And with the improvement of the gravity wave uh, detection uh, sensitivity, uh, there's a hope that we can capture even a weak signal. So this work that we are uh, uh, taking on has uh, uh, various challenges. First, there's limited literature. Uh, as mentioned, most of the studies that we have uh, seen and heard is about uh, in the context of gauge string or number go to strings. Then there's rapid uh, development of the global string simulation recently. However, uh, it's still not converging. There are more to investigate. In particular, it's uh, difficult to cover the hierarchical scales. Uh, that's the difference from the number uh, go to string case. Then also, if you consider the uh, axon strings related to axon dark matter, when axon get mass, uh, there's also domain wall on top of the cosmic string. So it's more complicated. Our approach is we start with the simplest case where the, uh, to consider the signal from global string associated with massless goldstone. Then we'll gradually build up to consider the uh, QCD axion or general L case. So our approach is semi-analytical. We have this so-called VOS model, uh, including the goldstone emission. Then we calibrate the parameters with a simulation result, uh, which is available or they can directly uh, simulate for a low end or uh, a short period of time after the string formation, uh, string network formation. And our approach is a complement to the simulation studies because um, uh, the, the current simulation, because of the technical limitation, <clears throat> they can only directly simulate a short period of time uh, uh, after the string network formation. And for the later time, they need to do numerical extrapolation uh, to, <clears throat> to find observation, uh, observation the, the prediction for observation today. So, they, which may or may not be physical. But in our approach, we take the uh, simulation result to calibrate the model parameter. Then we encode the essential physics into the uh, evolution equation that we solve. So in a way, it may, uh, at least the known uh, essential physics captured even for the late time evolution instead of a, a pure extrapolation. Okay. So here is some um, main result. A key takeaway here is that uh, with the center cosmology has shown in our uh, early work and then updated last year, is that the signal, uh, gravity wave signal from axon global streams can indeed be detectable with upcoming experiments. And our finding also uh, was uh, later supported by the sim dedicated simulation studies, although there's some details that we will uh, differ still uh, need investigation. But the, the key takeaway is that the signal could be detectable, unlike some of the earlier references uh, literature suggested. Okay, so now uh, I can only uh, briefly go through uh, this uh, comparison between the number go to versus uh, the uh, global stream. So here is with the same symmetry breaking scale, the dash line, uh, the prediction uh, with uh, number go to or gauge strings, while these solid lines are prediction from global strings. So as you can see, uh, overall, as expected, the signal from global strings uh, has much smaller amplitude, also red shifted, and also the, uh, there's a logarithmically declining tail instead of flat uh, plateau that we, we are familiar with already. So the explanation for this uh, big differences can be traced back to the fact that the goson emission is a leading mode now, and consequently, the loops are much shorter lived. Uh, also, there's a log factor, this divergence factor in the uh, string tension leading to this declining behavior. We also investigated the FT correspondence in the global string case and found there's some key difference from the, <coughs> uh, the number go to case. Uh, in particular, uh, we found that with the same frequency, uh, the, with the global string uh, spectrum, it actually can uh, enable us to probe much higher temperature, up to 10 to the 8 GeV uh, in radiation temperature. Okay, so we also uh, look into how the non standard cosmology and the new equation state uh, and new particle species, new degrees of freedom uh, can alter this uh, prediction as what we did for the 
uh, number go toward the extremes. So these are the results uh, that we found. Okay, so now let me conclude. Um, uh, cosmic strings, uh, as we have learned, is a well-motivated source for gravitational waves, and it can serve as a uh, unique tool for reconstruct the timeline of pre-BBN history uh, based on this FT correspondence, and then can also help us to find new particles, uh, particle species uh, through these uh, new degrees of freedom searches. Then even if uh, the string network were diluted or partially diluted by inflation, they can actually regrow back into the horizon surprisingly and leave uh, distinct gravity wave signals. And finally, uh, I also show you that a gravity wave from global axon strings uh, could be detectable and can be a smoking uh, gun for axon dark matter. Uh, <clears throat> along this line, uh, to progress towards uh, the case for actual dark matter axion, uh, I'm, uh, I have this ongoing work with my, uh, uh, also my student, Chafeng, to uh, better understand the uh, dynamics of the axon domain walls. So uh, this is the conclusion. So unfortunately, I'm not able to participate in person. So in case uh, you have a uh, uh, discussion or comments uh, 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 after the, the session, you're welcome to reach out to me by email. So thank you. Thank you, Yano. So now we take questions. There are any questions? Yeah. So uh, uh, the, the strings that we're talking about, I mean, I guess I could ask this question from other people as well. Mm -hmm. They can carry current, in particular, they can be superconducting, for instance, axiom strings, as was pointed out by some of the audience. Um, have you included that in the BOS equations that you are solving? And do they actually change those equations in any way and change the gravitational spectrum? Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, we did not include that uh, that effect, but I think there were some studies on uh, superconducting strings that uh, would be interesting to look into more. But yeah, it's not all uh, universally relevant, I think. Do, but, do you uh, have any intuition, to, like just qualitatively, what features do they give rise to in the gravitational wave spectrum? Yeah, I, I cannot explain. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, yeah, it, it needs some uh, dedicated studies. I, I cannot uh, comment on that uh, on top of my head, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. we have, we have, when you have friction, I mean, as some people have shown, even the others, uh, the, the number of strings inside the Hubble horizon grows because uh, the string cannot meet any more to form groups and dissipate their energy. So the energy fraction of strings goes, so you would say, ah, this enhances gravity waves. But the problem is that if you have friction, then the motion is not relativistic. So it should not radiate gravity waves. So, yeah, I cannot, can hear, I cannot hear everything you say clearly, but I think you're talking about the effect of fric friction, right? Yeah, if you have friction, you have more yeah. strings, but the motion is dense. So yeah. it's yeah, difficult I think to consider gravity waves. Yeah, that, that is a good question. So, um, what I, I think of the friction, yeah, people talk, uh, they did put into that, that account in the, this, uh, the analytical model. But in general, it's found that the friction is important at, at the early stage of the, the string evolution. But uh, once it's a ratio scaling regime, I think the friction effect is, uh, is not important. But then you recover the standard abundance for cosmic strings. Uh, Maybe there is a trade-off. I don't know. Yeah, but I, I, maybe there may be some special cases the friction can be important for the later evolution. But I think the friction is most important at the early stage. But then uh, the, once the string reaches the scaling regime, it, it's not. Uh, I, I think that the friction term uh, becomes negligible in the evolution equation. Yes, I agree. But, yeah, maybe there's some special case, but that, that's what I rem uh, I recall. Yeah. Yeah, but once it's reached a scaling regime in general, it's in, in sensitive to the like the 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 earlier time where what's the, the friction uh, the details is. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, let's thank Piano again.